Well, welcome everybody to a uh, very, very special event this evening. Uh, my name is Joe Martin. I have the privilege of being uh, your president and CEO of your Dulles Regional Chamber. Uh, this next um, edition of In a Word is very special as we are combining it with the launch of a brand new committee, our Inclusion and Equity Committee. And of course, the word for this evening is, is equity. And we're so happy to be here and so um, pleased to be celebrating uh, Black History Month with a great event like this. So I'm going to start uh, the uh, evening off by turning it over to our chair of the In a Word Committee, Mr. Bob Decker. Take it away, Bob. Hey, thanks, Joe. Today's In a Word discussion focuses on equity and inclusion, as Joe had mentioned, an essential part of both our culture uh, at Cox Business and our business strategy at Cox. We believe that the collective sum of our individual experiences, backgrounds, and skills are key drivers of innovation, continued business growth, and improved performance. And we embrace an inclusive, inclusive culture of fairness and respect, value and belonging, uh, empowerment and growth. No two employees look or think the same, and we prefer it that way. Today, I look forward to hearing from our distinguished speakers about the importance of building and sustaining a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplace. Cox Business and the Dulles Regional Chamber of Commerce, thank you for supporting the In a Word series of informative sessions on topics of good value to our business community. I'm looking forward to an engaging discussion uh, this afternoon. Now I would like to introduce our moderator uh, for our discussion today, Mike Williams. Mike is an executive coach, a business coach, a sales coach, and also president of, the growth, president of the Growth Coach of Northern Virginia. Also, Mike is a board member on the Dulles Regional Chamber of Commerce. So without further ado, Mike, uh, why don't you take it from here? Thanks a lot, Bob. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome to In a Word, Equity Stories of Tangible Workplace Change. Uh, as Bob mentioned, I'm Mike Williams. I own the Growth Coach in Northern Virginia, and I help business owners, executives, and sales organizations grow. Um, I'm on the board of directors uh, with the chamber, and I help out where I can. And today, I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator. And you know, um, as a business coach, when I work with my clients, I always talk with them about doing big things, working on objectives and goals that are bigger than them. And this particular topic today is certainly bigger than all of us. And so we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about it in a minute, but uh, let's talk a little bit about um, in a word, you know, in a word and uh, what we want to accomplish today in a word is a Dulles Regional Chamber of Commerce series that focuses on topics that are relevant to our members, our business leaders and our community. Today, the Dulles Regional Chamber of Commerce and Award Committee has joined forces with the Equity Committee to provide a fantastic event. Together, honoring Black History Month, we have an event every business leader who seeks implementable ideas to end racism should attend. Right now, I'd like to introduce Madhu Garlanka of Alwyn Corporation and Chairperson of the Inclusion and Equity Committee. Madhu, take it away. Thank you, Mike. Hello, everyone. I'm Madhu Garlanka. I'm the founder and CEO of Alvin Corporation. We are a woman and minority owned business located in Herndon, Virginia, and we've been operating for the last 17 years, providing software solutions to customers locally and nationwide. I'm also the chair of the Inclusion and Equity Committee at the Dulles Chamber and on the board. Uh, a little bit about the committee. The committee consists of chamber members and board members who meet on the third Thursday of each month from four to five. The goal of the committee is to take steps to achieve tangible progress in inclusion and equity of minorities in business. The committee is about six months old and the activities for the first year of the committee including, include listening from speakers, understanding the breadth and depth of issues and different perspectives in the space so that it then enables us to come up with actionable steps 
and real solutions. We hope to be able to impact the minority business community in a positive way by providing support, guidance, assistance, and advocating for policy change um, as needed. Uh, the mission of this, if this the committee is to make sure that um, the, in, the, the principles of equity and inclusion are part of all aspects of the DRCC culture, such that at some point we do not need a committee like this. In other words, we must end racist, racism. At this point, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce Ms. Dory Scott, the founder president of Wise Woman LLC, an education services counseling and training firm. And she also serves as the managing director of the Joy Group, a learning center committed to equity, inclusion, and diversity. Dory. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share with you a few words to inspire you and to take them along your way as you continue in your struggle, in your pain, and in your joy as we find peace for all. You see, I am we, she, her, and black, brown, red, yellow. I might even be white. Seeking higher heights, a rainbow in the sky, the bountiful dream as told by the dream keeper. Yet because although my hue is darker than my other sisters and brothers, I sit, I wait, I'm looking, I'm deciding, am I enough? So I wait, I'm deferred, divided, often underdecided. Will you let me in? Will you let me in? Will you let me in? I look toward the road ahead to climb, keep peace, join hesitantly and be accepted. Housing is lesser, education may be second class, no shots because COVID is killing her people. Yet I wait and with fervor, I no longer sit at the sideline in pursuit of freedom, justice, equity for all. No hating, no hating, no hating, no hating. I wait and walk with you side by side, black, brown, red, yellow seeking higher heights. Thank you. That was fantastic, Dory. Thank you very much for that. And so um, when we look at the agenda today, we've got a lot of great stuff for you. And it's basically broken into three sections. Um, we have Mark Warner, U.S. Senator uh, for the state of Virginia, who's going to open for us. And then we have four fantastic stories of uh, equity and, uh, uh, you know, tangible workplace change. And so we've got um, a number of great leaders here. We have um, Apoorva Gandhi, Vice President, Multicultural Affairs, um, uh, Marriott International. And then we have Kendall Hallbrook, CEO of Dev Technology Group. Chris Wright, Vice President, Member Solutions for Common App. And then we have a call to action where Radhika Bagaji and uh, Nathan Onibudo are going to talk to us about a great opportunity where we'll be able to actually um, put equity and diversity into action. So definitely stick around to the very end. Um, I think we've got a great call to action. It's going to be a lot of fun for you, and we want everybody to, to, uh, to hang in there with us. And so right now, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mark Warner, U.S. Senator for the state of Virginia. Hello, I'm Virginia Senator Mark Warner, and I want to commend the Dulles Regional Chamber of Commerce for joining with others in the community in celebrating and appreciating Black History Month. Um, I think it is extraordinarily important at this moment in time that we promote and encourage greater equity in our society. I say this not only as a United States Senator and former governor, but I say this as well as somebody who started my career in business as an entrepreneur. Um, 
my first business venture. I took my whole life savings, five thousand dollars, invested in a little energy start startup company. And you went know that company went broke in six weeks. And then went a real estate venture and that venture failed in six months. So at the ripe old age of twenty six with student debt, uh, I ended up spending a lot of time sleeping on my friend's couches, flat broke, but I got a third opportunity. And uh, that opportunity led to a beginning of a career in cellular telephones and then became a venture capitalist and was extraordinarily blessed. But I also realized that if I had not been a white guy with the appropriate ed education, that I might not have got a third shot or a second shot or a first shot. So as the Dallas Regional Chambers talk about equity, equity is about that notion that equality in and of itself does not provide equity. If you give two folks $10 a piece, uh, but one person has enormous wealth and another person has nothing, those $10 are, are different values. So it is incredibly important as we promote equity that we think about making sure that everybody in Virginia, everybody in America gets the kind of fair shot that I was lucky enough to have. And in a community like Dulles Serves that has such diversity, not just in terms of black Americans, but a host of other diverse Americans, that equity is absolutely key to our economic future. And this issue has is even driven home more in the last year. We all know that COVID has disproportionately hit Virginians and Americans, hitting black Americans and brown Americans at a much greater rate. We've seen that as well in terms of uh, black and brown businesses getting access to capital. Uh, unfortunately, the PPP program, while well, well-intentioned, ended up supporting many more white and majority-owned businesses than it did minority-owned businesses. It's one of the reasons why I'm so proud in the last COVID relief bill that I was able to secure $12 billion to invest in minority <laughs> repository institutions, community development financial institutions, those institutions that will provide access to capital to minority firms so that uh, those entrepreneurs can have the same kind of second and third chance opportunities that I had. Uh, again, I think it's terribly important that the Dulles Regional Chambers um, recognize this need to provide a more equity-based system in our country. I commend you for working with the local community on recognizing Black History Month, and I hope that you'll be willing to call upon me and my office in any way that I can uh, support and um, provide uh, uh, help on these efforts, whether it be from legislative, whether it be from convening, or whether it be from simply continuing to build the case. So again, congratulations, and let's have a brighter and more fair and just and equitable America and Virginia in our future. Very good. Well, we'll move forward with, uh, with our, our, uh, our stories of uh, equity and diversity with these great companies that we have here. Uh, Marriott International is a leading global lodging company with more than over 7,000 properties in 135 countries and territories. The company, that, the company began in 1927 as a nine-seat A&W root beer stand in Washington, D.C., is recognized today as a top employer for superior business operations. They're headquartered in Bethesda, Maryland, and I'd like to introduce Apoorva Gandhi, Vice President, Multicultural Affairs and Business Councils for Marriott International. Apoorva, please share with us an example of how Marriott International manages racial equity and diversity in your businesses. Great, thank you. <clears throat> thanks, Mike, and thanks everyone at the Dallas Regional Chamber of Commerce, and especially Sharon Myers for inviting me to speak. Uh, I come to you, if you, if you can look behind me from uh, the great hotel that she works at, which is the Westfields Marriott, uh, which is right in the area there. It's a beautiful place. If you haven't been there, uh, please check it out. It's, a, it's one of the, the jewels in our portfolio. Uh, so thanks so much, Sharon, for, for inviting me. Um, and and uh, she's the best in the business. Um, again, my name is Apoor Vigandi. I'm Vice President of Multicultural Affairs for Marriott International. Um, before I get started, I just want to reassure you, a lot of times when uh, people hear my title, they say, Multicultural Affairs, what does that mean? Sounds rather exotic. Let me reassure you that my job is not to go around the world having multicultural affairs. It's more to be able to talk and, and work every day to help Marriott be uh, a place that welcomes all no matter who you are, where you come from, or who you love, or what your abilities are. I just have a really quick story I'd love to tell you about. 
on, on how we have been able to exhibit how uh, diversity and inclusion, not only is it the right thing to do, it helps you drive great business. Um, we had a hotel um, in the area of one of our residence in hotels, uh, if you're familiar with it, it's kind of the extended stay brand. They saw an opportunity to welcome and delight guests from India who were here for about six months at a time um, doing training. So uh, we were able to really um, delight them by um, providing them a welcome kit when they arrived uh, at our hotel that had snacks from India. We uh, made sure to provide calling cards and upgraded our T1 lines because we knew that they'd be doing a lot of virtual meetings and Skype calls back home. And we wanted to give them a calling card because the first thing when he got home or got, got here from India was to call home and we didn't want them to have to fuss around with the phone. So a quick $5 calling card to let them know they re, uh, landed safe and sound. Um, we made sure that our residents in breakfast buffets, now keep in mind, this is all pre-COVID, um, you know, had all the great Marriott food, hot food, hot, cold food, cold. But we also added Indian breakfast three mornings a week. And let me tell you, that made all the difference in the world. Um, they just loved it. And not only did our Indian guests love it, everyone loved it. Uh, everyone loved a little bit of change in, uh, in the food in the morning. And it was a big hit. We also made sure that we uh, brought in Indian newspapers and the television channels so everyone could watch their Bollywood movies and cricket championships. Uh, we would also uh, use our airport vans and things like that to uh, be able to take folks to the Indian grocery stores should they want to cook uh, on their own in the room. And it was a big hit. Everyone really loved that. Uh, once a month, we would do an India night event at our hotel, kind of in the lobby or gatehouse area, where we would drape um, the, the lobby area with beautiful saris, play Bollywood music, have a henna artist. Uh, and things like that. It was a huge hit um, and really built a lot of loyalty uh, from these travelers to our hotels. But let me tell you from a business perspective what also it did. We were able to increase our annual room nights at this residence in hotel by 9,500 room nights. That is a lot for a residence in, 9,500 room nights. Our annual profit at that hotel, uh, we uh, increased it by $300,000. And our change in RevPAR, which is revenue per available room, went up 10%. And we moved to number one in that metric uh, with what we call our comp set of comparable hotels. Uh, for those, um, uh, for that hotel, it was a really, really big deal. Not only did it show that inclusion um, can also bring forth the idea of welcoming all and helping everyone feel great in our hotels, it's also good business. So as we always say, uh, doing uh, doing business that is good is good business. So that's a, a quick story I'd like to share uh, with some measurable, tangible results. Mike? Perfect. Uh, for just a couple of questions. Um, yeah. Why do you think it's so important to uh, to provide this inclusion and, and really working to make everyone feel comfortable? Um, it's, 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 it's important because for many, many reasons, one, we're in the hospitality business, right? So it's our job to delight and welcome all, no matter who they are. We want to make sure everyone feels great at Marriott. But also, if you think about it from a workplace perspective, ensuring that people feel that like they belong as they are um, really helps build loyalty um, to you, your, your, your workplace as a place to come work every day, to your brand as a place to do business. But, but also from a workplace perspective, people feel like they belong. They're, they're more engaged. Yeah. They're going to do better work. They're not going to want to leave you. We all know as business owners, when you lose someone good, there's a cost to that. <laughs> you have to go and find someone. You lose productivity on your side. Then when you do find someone, you have to make sure you, they get them um, comfortable in doing. So there's a cost to all that. Why not make people feel good as they are and help them do their best work? Yeah, and so it's not just an internal thing for the business itself. Um, it affects the community, it affects uh, the guests. And so final question, what makes this kind of work so difficult for all of us? Um, yeah, well, you're spot on. It is bigger than just employment, right? It is about your business and, and reaching as many new and different revenue streams as you can, right? It's a good thing to have different uh, different groups of, of customers and segments. What makes it hard, I think, is um, 
it's, it's, it's it, it, every day. It's, it's important to focus on it, right? Diversity and inclusion has to be part of your culture and core values of your, of where you work. If it's not part of your culture and core values, it'll be viewed kind of as extra work. And typically everyone's so busy that they don't have time to do what is considered extra work. Yeah. We at Marriott consider it part of our culture of putting people first and welcoming all. So it is part of our core values. It is embedded in what we do. If it's viewed as just political correctness and being nice just to be nice um, and not part of your business strategy, that's where it falls by the wayside, unfortunately. Uh, I also think um, in, in today's time, uh, given what's been going on in, in the, over the last few years, uh, th- its importance um, has is just shown through even more. It's been reinforced even more every day. And um, to be a place where people feel comfortable as they are and doing good business that welcomes everyone is good for your brand. It's In our case, it's good for our hotels. It's good for our corporation. Um, it's good for our guests. It's good for our business. Very well said, Apoorva. Thank you very much. My uh, pleasure. Next, we have Dev Technology Group. Dev Technology provides IT solutions to meet the mission critical needs of government by exceeding their clients' expectations through partnership, commitment, to teamwork, collaboration, and valuing their employees. They're headquartered in Reston, Virginia. Please help me welcome Kendall Holbrook, CEO of Dev Technology Group. Kendall, please share an example of how Dev Technology supports racial equity and diversity in your world of business. Sure, thank you so much, Mike. And, you know, Porva, it was great to hear your story at Marriott. And, you know, I, I kind of was nodding along and, and smiling and you you actually had me take some notes. Um, you know, I think what's important about Dev Technology and, you know, Mike, we, I shared this with you last week is that we actually were designed to be a, a company that was a little bit different, right? We are an IT integrator for the federal government and our founders, Susie Sylvester and Sinjeev Dougal, back in 1998, kind of had a vision of a different type of company, one where people could be happy and enjoy coming to work. You know, one that had, you know, nice offices and we and one that did the right thing for not only our clients, but also our employees, right? Putting our clients and employees on equal footing. And the only real way to do that is through, you know, equity and inclusion of all people. You know, Susie and Sanjeev both come from you know, minority groups uh, and two different minority groups. So themselves understood what it was like to not be included, not to be treated equitably. So, you know, they kind of baked it into our core. And when I joined the company 11 years ago, you know, I remember my first day at work, it felt like I was comfortable. I was at home I, and I couldn't really even explain it. You know, I knew I knew a few members of the team, but we hadn't really ever worked together under one space. But I, I showed up and went to my desk and there were flowers on my desk. And, you know, they had planned a lunch where, you know, our corporate team could go out to lunch together. I just felt like I, I was wanted. And, you know, and that is the feeling we try to replicate every day with every person that we hire. Aporva was 100% right where he said, when he said that it is good business, right? So from a, a dev perspective, we look at a population of IT folks, IT people, whether they're application developers or, you know, they're system administrators or whatever they do in the IT spectrum, um, who can not only do their job, but also be additive to our culture. And I think that's important. Um, it, it, it's all related back to our core values, right? Of integrity and respect and collaboration and community. Um, it, it, it's de- de- directly related. And so we see um, equity, inclusion, diversity, all interwoven woven into just who we are as a company. Um, what's changed for us? And you know, I think this is where the story part gets interesting. What's changed for us is even though we were designed this way, as we grow, it's hard to keep that focus, you know, keep the attention paid to it. It was one thing when it was Susie and Sanjeev and they were making all the hiring decisions and, you know, they got to make sure that the, uh, the recruiting pool was representative of, you know, our communities as well as our client base. Um, but it's different now where we are very distributed. I don't meet every new hire until they're a new hire. I do meet them on their first day of work, but not before then. So I don't, I don't get to test, 
you know, what our recruiting team is doing or our, our manager or who our managers are hiring. And so we're changing our approach such that we implement some intentional practices in the company. So here are a few things that we're doing. Um, we actually announced in January our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the company. And that commitment spells out what, what every employee, what every client, what every potential employee can expect from us as an organization. So it's very high level, it's one page, easy to read, easy to absorb. <laughs> we then are backing that commitment up with an action plan around each of the commitment areas. Um, and to create that plan, we decided to open up our steering committee to any employee who wants to join. So we did an all call to all employees. We asked for volunteers. I think we're at 24 volunteers right now. So for a company of 250 employees, you know, we got 10%. That's an awesome turnout. And we're having our first, <laughs> so we're having our first kickoff meeting in about a week from now. But we did have a small committee because it's obviously Black History Month. So we had a small group from that committee come together uh, at the end of last week just to make sure we had some 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 program so some programming in place for this month as well. Um, then a couple of other tangible things we did. So in addition to that committee, we also are starting and ensuring that we're doing pay equity testing, right? So making sure we're, we're observing that what we've put in place is actually being implemented. So, so doing that testing, getting those metrics. We are proud that 50% of our workforce is made up of minorities mm -hmm. and almost 40% is made up of women. And in IT, in IT companies, that's hard, right? Just because there are less women graduates out of the IT, in the IT fields, right? I was one of 12, uh, five or six in my computer science department when I graduated undergrad and which is about 11%. And I just looked nationwide and it's still about 11, 12% of women graduating from computer science. So the pool, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult, but we're proud that we do seek out um, women in IT and in addition to minorities in IT. A um, couple other things that we're doing, we are expanding where we're recruiting. We are adding HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities to our recruiting pool, as well as veterans organizations and women in technology organizations. So intentionally going to places where we can find more diverse candidates. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, other than that, you know, I, I, it's important, right? As Apoorva said, it's important to retain, it's important for recruiting, and it's important for customer satisfaction. You know, I've had more than one candidate tell us, actually new hire, because I meet them when they're new hires, tell us that when they went to their website and saw the diversity represented there, that was help, that helped them make their decision to choose dev. So it does come directly down to business value. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to ask you, Kendall. It, it's a little different for you because from the start, you've been, you've been living this. And so how is that perceived internally? Um, it's, it's just a part of who we are and what we do. Um, you know, I, I heard Susie, our founder and former CEO, once describe the company. You know, someone said, what, what is it like to work at Dev? And she said, I like to think of it as pleasant. You, mm -hmm. I show up for work people with people who I like to work with, people who respect me, um, and, and that's kind of what it's like. So my one of my big objectives when we were designing my position as a successor CEO was the cultural champion for the company to make sure that that feeling that everyone has when they walk in the door doesn't change with our growth. Um, so it, it's just you just have to double down. You have to do yeah. pay equity testing. You have to intentionally recruit out of different recruiting pools. You have to make sure that we're checking in with clients and that they're satisfied with, with the services we're providing and the people we're bringing to them. We're an IT services company, so our people are a product. Um, so it, it, and it's important, you know, I think we talked as well, Mike, that it's important that our employees represent our client base, right? Our clients in the federal government community are very diverse, yeah. right? And so we want our employees to look you know, holistically, like our client base as well. So, so, so there are a couple of couple of things that are important as we grow. 
Well, so glad to hear you're reaching out to historically black colleges and universities. I'm a, I'm a product of that and I'm also a veteran, so that's fantastic. So you talked a little bit about the internal. When you look at the external, are there any external forces that have helped and guided or are there some that distracted the process at all? Um, I think there were a couple that made, uh, made us feel like it was time to be more intentional. Um, some external forces. And in particular, right, obviously we were all reeling after the murder of George Floyd. And, you know, that was the first time I actually felt compelled to address race and justice, you know, social issues in a very deliberate and specific way with the organization. And I, it took me a couple of days, but I penned a very impassioned email that told personal stories, you know, and just where I land on this issue, right? To be very clear. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was that coupled with, we, um, we've we been very fortunate and, and it's thanks to all of our employees, but we've won Washington's top workplace award, award for seven years in a row. Wow. And in what, well, thank you. And two years ago, I got contacted by a journalist who wanted to write a story about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and wanted to know how we turned the company around and, you know, what was our, what was our story? And, you know, I, I sat there, I talked to Susie, our founder, and I talked to our director of HR at the time, and we're like, well, we don't have a turnaround story. And that's when I realized we needed to have a story, <laughs> regardless if it was about a turnaround or not. So, you know, you couple those couple of external factors together, Hence the dev commitment, the steering committee, and then some of these more intentional actions that we're taking. Wow. Well, you have a great story, and we appreciate you sharing with us that. Um, thank you so much, Kendall. Um, we're yeah. going to move to Common App. Common Application is an undergraduate college admission application that applicants may use to apply to any of more than 900 member colleges and universities in 50 states in the District of Columbia to include Canada, China, Japan, and many European countries. They are a not-for-profit not organization located in Arlington, Virginia. And today we have with us Chris Wright, Vice President, Member Solutions for Common App. Chris, tell us a little bit about your organization and how you are, um, you are supporting equity and diversity in the workplace. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for that introduction. And I just wanted to say to a uh, poor friend, Kenda, Kendall, um, very great, tangible examples of, of solid work to move the needle on equity and diversity. So, so kudos to, to both of you and your organization. So I'm Chris Wright. I'm uh, with Common App. I've been with Common App for a little less than a year, and I was chosen to present to you all. And I appreciate you all coming, and I appreciate um, the Dulles uh, Regional uh, Chamber of Commerce are having me today. So just want to get into uh, it a little bit, just give you a little um, overview of Common App before I get into the meat of, of the change that we, we've implemented for next year. Uh, Common App's a membership organization, which all of its members have a shared vision um, and mission in support of inspiring students in their journey to post-secondary educational attainment. Uh, our work is really direct um, to students and, and really helping those students seek a quality education and ensure that all students get the best connection to our members. Uh, we got our start back uh, about 45 years ago as a membership of 15 institutions and we've grown to over 900 institutions, private, public, international, minor minority serving institutions. Annually, we see more than a million students using our platform to submit over 5 million applications to these 900 plus members. This year, we've already surpassed 6 million applications submitted at this time with over 1.1 million unique students coming and submitting applications. But we also know that there are over 800,000 that actually don't submit applications. And that's really why I'm here today to, to share a little bit of that work. Our CEO, uh, Jenny Ricard, uses this uh, Nelson Mandela quote in a lot of her conversations. Uh, this is what has been the foundation of our work at Common App because we believe that education 
is our fundamental opportunity to create a more just and equitable society. While we're now uh, seeing lots of dramatic change across our, a lot of social sectors to address inequity, higher education has a lot to do to break down those, those barriers that prevent talented people from pursuing their education. And this project was the start of that journey to reimagine the application process to create a new system to address many inequities in the college admissions process, therefore creating equity for all. So when I came on board uh, 11 months ago in February, uh, I immediately started working on this project. I was new to, to Common App. Jenny said, I have an idea. I wanna try to break down some of these barriers, go. And I was like, great, I've only been here two weeks and uh, guess what? The, the company shut down, everyone went remote and here I am back in Boston, now I'm in, in, in Arlington, but I'm back in Boston. I'm like, okay, so how do I do this? Uh, uh, working remotely with people I don't really know. Uh, but, but the staff, uh, member institutions, school counselors, policymakers are all um, in place to, to really help us understand what these inequities are, these barriers for students. And the, the six categories that you see on the screen is, is really the, the high priority categories we decided to tackle this year, religion, sex and gender, citizenship, family, school discipline, and um, military history. And I just wanted to share um, why we decided to do this. This was really work that was rooted in our vision to create an un unambiguous path to educational attainment for all students while influencing changes to the application that were barriers associated with application completion. Mention I, I did mention that uh, about 800,000 students actually don't submit applications through our platform, and we needed to figure out why there, there was a barrier associated with those 800,000 students. Something else that was really important was to ensure our members still got the information that they need to make informed decisions on students' candidacy. So um, what you see here is really the process that we put together that was 11 months long uh, that just ended yesterday, actually. Uh, we had our last uh, presentation on all of our changes and they were well received by our, our member institutions. But we had to figure out the process to impact change, fully align ourselves around our mission, look critically at our own data, ensure verse voices were heard early and often, uh, go through a distillation process. I, I like my sips of whiskey and um, you know the whiskey distillation process, you try things over and over and over again uh, until you have a finished product. And that's what you see here on the screen. And this process will continue to repeat until we removed all the barriers associated with educational attainment. So as an example of some of our data findings, um, I wanted to flag one of the areas that we felt uh, was the right decision to make, which was to remove the school discipline question from next year's application. Uh, it, external data is clear that school discipline disproportionately impacts students of color and black students in particular. We started to discover when we looked at our own application data, we started to see how something as simple as a question on our application, this was really exacerbated even in the application process. So I think about a student that may have perfect grades, we see them a lot, that may have a blemish from their past that may walk away from our application because they were afraid to disclose information at a point that's at the top of the application funnel or or the student that may not have a selection that represents uh, their particular situation or with regard to their citizenship. Um, you know, by, by studying ourselves on behalf of students, we hope to increase a college going culture by ensuring they can see them full selves and be their full selves without having to walk away from the application. So uh, like I mentioned, we just recapped our, our um, session yesterday and members seem really appreciative of these changes. And we look forward to starting the whiskey distillation process next year to remove more barriers in support of students. That's fantastic. And so when you look at the work that you've been doing and you look at the spectrum from, from the start to now, um, Chris, what, 
you know, how rewarding is that for the organization? Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see everyone um, across our membership really embrace uh, our, our vision and, and the realities of removing all of these barriers, right? Because if, if it's rooted in students and if it's rooted in their accomplishments, no matter what, you should be in support of, of this change. Of course, there were naysayers along the way and, oh, we're not going to get that data point that was really essential to our process. Uh, but when you combat that with data, such as less than 1% of our students actually submit a disciplinary issue, that's only 24,000 students out of 1.1 million applicants. How big of an issue really is it, right? Um, so when you combat that with data and the, the reason why it's compelling, I feel we can accomplish a, a lot of great things. And Chris, do you see Common App doing, you know, more or are they more or less likely to implement more changes? No, <laughs> much, much more likely uh, to, to implement a lot of changes. We just started a, a process where we're calling it the revolution of the college application. So uh, if I were to uh, show this group here what in a college application looked like 45 years ago, it really looks the same. So how, how has the college admissions process evolved to meet students where they're at in order to support their journey? That's what we're about to embark on. So you're gonna see a lot of great things coming from the organization for sure. Perfect, Chris, we thank you so much for sharing. And I just think it's amazing that, you know, you've got this one application that you can really shoot around the globe. And uh, boy, I wish that that would have been around when, when I was submitting, but uh, I guess I was back in the stone ages there. <laughs> You're in the military. So thank you for your service, Mike. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Um, thanks a bunch, Chris. Um, we're going to move um, to another one of our great guests. It's Gail Bissett. And um, she, um, Gail was part of the Minority Business Development Agency. Um, Gail was a former executive director and she's now a consultant for the Minority Business Development Agency, which is a part of the federal procurement for the U.S. Department of Treasury located in the District of Columbia. And um, Gail, please share with us how the Minority Business Development Agency addresses racial equity and diversity. Unmute myself. Good. Afternoon, evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chamber, for inviting me to attend this event. And um, I'm going to do a special thank you to you. Um, just want to first talk to you a little bit about uh, MBDA, Minority Business Development Agency, what it is and how it exists. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so MBDA is the only federal government agency that's solely dedicated to the growth and the inclusion and the global competitiveness of minority business enterprises. It's been around for over 50 years. It started under the Nixon administration and uh, it provides um, business development and advisory services to minority businesses in across the United States. So how it works is MBDA headquarters and MBDA, like I said, is the is a Bureau of the U.S. Department of Commerce, but MBDA um, awards grants to profit and nonprofit organizations to operate a network of business centers. Uh, we have 27 business centers and nine specialty centers. Um, and these business centers help minorities gain better access to securing capital, uh, competing for contracts, uh, identifying strategic partners, uh, becoming export ready, and entering into new markets. Our clients are minority businesses that own and operate, or who are owned and operated by African Americans, Asian Americans, uh, Native Americans, Hispanics, Latinos, uh, uh, and Pacific Islanders. And most of our clients um, have a starting an uh, annual revenue of a million dollars. And we have clients that's up to $200 million. And so for the business centers, most of them 
help their clients um, seek opportunities in their uh, geographical local areas. But we also have what I said before, specialty centers. These are the export centers. We have four of those across the US. We have um, advanced manufacturing centers, helping the minority manufacturing sell um, their products um, they are made in American products globally. The export centers actually help minorities understand how to become export ready. And, um, and we have uh, four advanced manufacturing centers. We only have one federal procurement center. And that's the center that I was the executive director and currently is a consultant. And we help clients gain better access to um, federal government contracts. That's fantastic. Um, just a couple of questions for you, Gail. Um, why do we still need organizations like this? Well, um, it's pretty obvious. We still have a long way to go as far as helping minorities get, get to the table or get at the table. We, um, as um, the senator spoke early on, and it's a great example, um, if he was a minority, uh, failing once or twice and three times, um, uh, he at least had an opportunity to get that third chance. And oftentimes right. minorities do not. Yeah. And so it's a constant battle because uh, minorities are oftentimes perceived as not having the intelligence or the capabilities just by the color of their skin to perform the work and to provide great stellar um, work and performance. And so, um, but also, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to MBDA and the other minority programs that exist. And also uh, what else I'm very happy about that since last year with the George Floyd um, incident and uh, the Black Lives Matter and everything like that, more agencies are now stepping up. And they have, um, these, these regulations have existed for years, but oftentimes they did not have accountability. So now um, the local elected officials, they have their equity and inclusion programs, they're putting teeth in them. So I'm glad to see that. And family is the time in our lives that we as minorities really um, are not silenced and we have a voice. And um, unfortunately, um, you know, uh, uh, based on what happened last year, it has heightened um, the need to recognize the diversity and to put these programs in place. That's fantastic. And Gail, you've given us some, some fantastic information. Um, what would you like us to come away with? What are some of the key takeaways that, that you've got for us? Um, well, I'm going to give you a little example, and, um, and, and this example is not only should we you know, continue to advocate the inclusion participation of minorities in you know, state, federal, and local procurement activities, we as minorities have to do a better job of supporting each other and teaming with each other. Um, this, this is a very, very short um, example I have. It was a um, one of our clients was the HVACA, HVAC client and was working as a subcontractor as a federal agency. And the contract that they were working on was coming up for recompete. So they thought that they had the uh, capabilities and the wherewithal um, to go after this particular contract as a prime. And so uh, through some market research, they found out that the recompete was coming out in about a year or so and that the agencies was planning to uh, their uh, acquisition procurement method was going to be 8A. Well, they didn't have the 8A certification, so they came to us at MBDA and asked for our assistance. And so we helped them through the process and they received this certification within a year. Then uh, when the contract came out um, or was posted, to their surprise, it was not procured through 8A, but through a GSA schedule. There's a building in materials, a special schedule, and they mm -hmm. didn't have that either, nor did they have time to get that GSA schedule. 
So um, they asked us to see if we had, knew of any um, company, preferably a minority company, they had to schedule. So long story short, we, we combed our da database and we found one of our other clients, which is a minority, um, that had the, um, the GSA schedule. So we scheduled a meeting with them, they met, and the GSA holder MBE said, sure, we'll work with you. But then the next day, the GSA holder MBE called, he said, hey, look, we looked at this procurement, I mean, this opportunity, and we feel that we can do it ourselves. Oh, boy. Very upset about that. Yeah, yeah. I was very upset about that. And so through, you know, several conversations and everything, um, and um, it showed that I was very upset. Um, we came to a mutual agreement and I wanted to make sure because now that the first MBE who was currently doing work at this federal agency, I want to make sure that he was treated, um, uh, he had an equitable uh, uh, work share because now they're subcontractors. So the point here is when an opportunity presents itself like that, and mind you, this was a $30 million dollar uh, contract value award over five years. Mm -hmm. So when an opportunity comes to you as a minority vendor and you have an opportunity to team with another minority ven vendor to build your capacity and to help you grow faster, then you should do the right thing. As right. much as we advocate for others to do for us, right. we have to support each other Work when together. those opportunities come. Absolutely. Certainly appreciate you sharing that and all the great information as well, Gail. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we're going to shift. We've heard a few great stories of, of how, um, you know, diversity and equity is personified in our workplace and workspaces. And so um, now we're going to shift and we're going to uh, move to our call to action. And We've got some great folks here to help us with that. Um, we've got Bookworm Central. Bookworm Central was founded with the wish to incessantly benefit and positively impact children's lives, both in the now and in their futures by providing easy access to quality books. Radhika Bagaji opted for fundraising book fairs as a platform that promises children direct and quick ass access to great books while ensuring additional giving into the schools and the community. Bookworm Central is located in Manassas, Virginia. What I love about Radhika, her vision, connecting books and readers, her mission, growing fine minds. And so we have today uh, Radhika Bagaj, President of Bookworm Central and Nathan Onibudo, student representative, Fairfax County School Board, and he's a senior at South County High School. Radhika and Nathan, please tell us about your program and, uh, and this wonderful call to action. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams. Um, I'm going to start um, and Radhika will join me in a bit, but my name is Nathan Onibudo. I just want to say thank you for the stories we've got to hear today and the conversations that we've got to have, as well as the opportunity to speak before all of you. Um, my name is Nathan Onibudo, and I am the student representative serving on the Fairfax County School Board. Serving on the Fairfax County School Board, I've had the privilege of working with leaders and policymakers on matters um, that impact student life. I've come to appreciate that students today cannot be placed in neat predetermined boxes. I've also come to recognize student, the world, students' worlds outside of school have a deep impact on in shaping their responses and outcomes within the classroom. Both of these observations have led me to understand that student learning experiences and their academic results are oftentimes dependent upon factors which school divisions cannot fully control. However, despite these stark disparities and related challenges, our school division strives for equitable outcomes for all its students something that makes me proud to call myself an FCPS student and a representative of the county. While campaigning for my position, I got to study and better comprehend the reasons behind achievement gaps. One that particularly struck me hard was that students from low income and marginalized backgrounds are less likely, less likely to receive a passing score on their third grade reading SOL. 
Research shows that this can be attributed to not having access to reading materials in their early years. In addition, I learned that students failing this test are less likely to catch up in future grades. It was then that I made a promise to do something about this achievement gap. And to that end, we established a partnership with an amazing local company, which supports us in hosting an online book drive, allowing community stakeholders like yourselves to donate and provide in-need students equitable access to books. I invite you to visit the In A Word bookstore, where in my words, you can buy a book and build a future. Briefly, I'd like to highlight a couple of the books um, that I've added to my recommended section in the portal. The first is a title I've selected for all the adults in the room. The book is called, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? The book sort of centers around the idea that parents of all types are hesitant to speak to their children about the idea of race. They worry that they might create problems where there aren't any. Dr. Tatum, the book's author and a clinical psychologist, um, discusses the ramifications of this phenomenon and the implications that, of conversations about race in a manner that I believe is quintessential given our nation's history, as well as our current reality. The second title I'd like to highlight within my recommended, se within my recommended section in the portal is a title called Page Saves the Day. Page Saves the Day is a self-published story written by Layla and Nelani Butler, students right here in Fairfax County Public Schools, about the beauty and heroism that stems from each of our own individual identities. And finally, on a personal note of things, I wanna say thank you for this project because it's very close to my heart. As it has allowed me to honor a promise, as it has allowed me to share the magic and power of books, and last but not least, it has allowed me to bring all FCPS students the possibility of equitable access to books. On behalf of all the FCPS students, I thank you for supporting our online book drive portal. I now invite Ms. Radhika Bajaj to share, who will share more about the book form mission, um, the work and a bit more about this collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan, for your personal commitment to this cause and for lending your voice to this fabulous community collaboration. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Radhika Bajaj, and I'm the founder and CEO of Bookworm Central. A few months ago, when Nathan shared his vision to coordinate a book drive for the benefit of FCPS students, I was immediately on board for several reasons. First, his purpose perfectly echoed our mission of connecting books with readers. Second, his call to action closely aligned with Bookworm's vision of growing fine minds. Third, he beautifully incorporated books in a celebration of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And last but not the least, he had a wish, and we had the perfect platform and solution to turn it into a reality. I am extremely grateful to Nathan for including us on this journey to provide ac equitable access to best books for all FCPS students. And today, as Nathan's, in a word, online bookstore is launched on Bookworm's platform, it opens up for all community stakeholders the opportunity to present in-need students with best books. What some may ask are best books and why are they important for all children? At Bookworm, we have made this our work for 29 years because best books reflect universal truths with clarity and artistry. They reveal that despite differences, people are essentially good and that life is infinitely worth living. They do not deny the existence of evil but rather focus on how our ongoing and thrilling struggle against evil. We can achieve it by many means, courage, promise, perseverance, faith, love. Like Nathan, we too believe that best books should be available for all young readers to awaken their imaginations, call forth their laughter and their tears, and urge them to be forever engaged in understanding and loving their fellow human beings. The availability and reading of such books constitutes a rich heritage, a rich experience, which extends beyond academic success and which is every child's birthright. I thank you once again for giving Nathan's call to action due consideration and for visiting his visionary online bookstore, In A Word. The upcoming video will guide you on how you may act today buy a book, build a future. Enjoy and please share and support Nathan's vision wholeheartedly within your businesses 
and outside of it in your network of friends and business associates? Well, okay, so um, the the website's pretty self-explanatory, but you have an opportunity to, um, you, can, you can donate a book, uh, you can donate money, or you can buy a book. And so within the school system, you can donate to, to different organizations within or classrooms, different things like that. Um, but it's a great opportunity to, uh, to pour into this, this topic that we're talking about, diversity and inclusion. And so you have an opportunity, buy books for friends, neighbors, relatives, buy books for others, donate money, um, or you can, uh, you can donate a book. So I encourage everyone that's able to be able to go out and do that. But how about this Nathan Odebudo, you guys? I mean, how? I mean, this is this is a this is a senior in high school. I don't know about you all, but I wasn't doing what he's doing as a senior in high school. So I'm 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 so proud of you, man. You're doing a great job, and you're going to you're going to go to the University of Virginia. Is that right? Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll be at UVA in the fall. So, so he's got to do he's got to go to UVA first, y'all. But I mean, he needs to have some, he needs some offers coming in right now. I mean, this guy's going to be doing some great things. So, um, but we appreciate that. Um, we definitely appreciate you, Radhika, uh, for setting this up for us. Um, certainly great material, great opportunity for all of us here. Um, I think we, we covered a number of things. We covered the, the polling. We've got that done. Um, again, I want to thank uh, Senator Warner for starting us off and all of the wonderful stories from the great leaders that, are, uh, that have agreed to uh, give their time and participate in this event. Um, one final thing for them, this event is called In a Word. And so we'd like to ask each of you uh, that, uh, that spoke, take yourself off mute. And we're going to ask you to give us uh, your thoughts on this event in one word. And we'll go from the starting, you know, right from the start, the way we lined you up. So we'll start with Apoorva. Your thoughts, one word. Empathy. Empathy. Very good. Very good. Uh, uh, who do we have next? Kendall? Value. Value. Chris? Progress. Progress, Gail. Intentional. Intentional. Okay, Radhika. You're on mute. And enlightening. Okay, and our final rock star, Nathan. Opportunity. Opportunity. I love it. I love, love it. This this has been so much fun. I mean, this is it's great information. It's an important topic. It's a topic that. We sometimes tend to want to avoid, but it's something that's right in front of us. Um, if we don't address it, we're going to have to live it anyway. And so I so appreciate the chamber for stepping out and providing this platform and this opportunity for each and every one of us. Um, I hope everyone had a great time. I hope that, that our members and our guests have found something that they can take away from this, that they can go out and implement just from what we've learned from these great organizations here. Um, so I think we're, we're wrapping things up. We're coming down the home stretch. I wanna thank each and every one of our guests. What a super job and um, putting the effort, the effort forth for each of us and uh, providing us some great insights. So I wanna thank every one of you for that. Hi, I'm Joe Fay. We're out here setting up for uh, Hot Meals Meals Distribution. Uh, we do this every night, 365 days a year. It's getting a lot more interesting and a lot tougher, but the need's the same and, in fact, growing. Last March, as COVID-19 swept into our community, there was never any question that facets would remain on the front lines to serve our neighbors. People's lives were depending on us. In 1988, Linda Wimpy met a homeless family in need of food. One warm meal turned into hot meals every night, and Facets was born. Over the years, Facets' role in Fairfax County has grown dramatically, but the mission remains the same, a community 
working together to alleviate the suffering caused by homelessness, poverty, and hunger. These are challenging times for us all, but especially for our most vulnerable and marginalized neighbors. Since March, Facets has had to adapt fast to our changing reality, and you've stood beside us every step of the way to meet the greatest needs of our community. As people worried about their next meal and how to put food on their tables, we increased Hot Meals distributions and expanded our food assistance to include grocery deliveries and weekly community-based mass food distributions. We're out distributing food this morning. Hi, I'm Jerry Caruso. I'm helping out tonight. We just fed hundreds of people and appreciate everything that everyone is doing for Facets. I'm really grateful for all of the uh, volunteers that come out to help us. For we serve over thousands uh, of, of people uh, when they provide us the food to serve them. With our homeless and unstably housed neighbors facing considerable risk during this crisis, we were able to increase our outreach activities and expand our work to manage an isolation and quarantine shelter. Here at our site, we make sure that our guests have three full meals a day, plus snacks. They have clothing that is purchased new or gently used and donated from our community partners. Also, our guests, they feel safe here. They feel warm, they're out of the elements, and they are safe and secure here at our site. We are so happy when they let us know that they have found a job or permanent housing or learned how to do something new. It's so encouraging to us. It's just as encouraging to us as it is to them. And again, I am so proud to be a part of a team like this. So happy to see the results and so thankful for you and all that you've done to partner with us and make this possible. Often you hear that families are just one paycheck away from being homeless. For the people Facet serves, it can be one circumstance, a loss of a job, an illness, a car repair, or any unexpected expense. During this crisis, as families struggle to keep roofs over their heads, we have been here with financial assistance to prevent evictions, keep utilities on, and pay medical bills. We are so happy that we are able to lend a helping hand during this time. As students and their families face significant struggles and worries about virtual learning and meeting basic needs, FACETS is there ensuring that they receive the support, supplies, and tools they need. Through the support from our community and everyone working together, we can ensure that the most basic needs of all families are met and that our children have the support for virtual learning during our daily homework help program and that they have the supplies they need in order to succeed and to break the cycle of poverty. From all of us on the ECD team, thank you for caring and thank you for your dedicated support. Every day of the week, FACET's program staff are out in the community delivering food, cleaning supplies, and PPE as they provide case management and make connections to life-changing resources. And, as temperatures drop, the doors to our hypothermia shelter remain open 24 hours a day. This season at hypothermia, we're doing things differently. We are, we're here 24 hours a day to make sure that none of our neighbors have to sleep outside during the cold winter months. When someone comes to hypo, we try to make the situation as comfortable as possible for them understanding that they are coming in from being homeless from living in cars, tents, and the woods. It can be really emotional. We know that we may be meeting some of our guests at the worst moments of their lives, so we are here with a warm, safe place to sleep, meals provided by our amazing faith partners and case management to help them connect with resources on their journey to stability. Thank you so much for providing the donations and support we need to operate Hypo this season. What you're doing is amazing and it's really helpful for all of our guests that, that stay at Hypo this year. One of FACETS' greatest strengths has been the ability to convene the community to rush to the assistance of those experiencing hardships. 
It is people from all backgrounds joining together to meet the critical needs among us. It is at these times that you find out just how much more you can do than you thought you could. That is the magic of community. Thank you to our community for helping our neighbors experiencing homelessness, poverty, and hunger. We couldn't do this without you. During these times of challenges and uncertainty, it means so much to know that you are all there for the children, families, and individuals who are struggling and need our help. You are bringing so much promise, relief, and hope. From all of us at Facets, thank you. It seemed to me obvious that any development should have its functional facets, but it also should have a fun, beauty, fantasy. There's sculpture that's sophisticated for adults, there's sculpture that's playthings for children, and uh, there are sculptures for different tastes, and yet they all belong, and they all have a place. They're all fixed in situ uh, in the environment. Modern sculpture tended to be misunderstood. We felt that if we could take sculpture and make it useful and engaging, and especially make pieces of sculpture that had another role to play, aside from being sculpture, we might succeed in making people love it more. Reston is a very unique place. It has a really great tradition of public art and an approach to public art that um, was really ahead of its time in terms of integrating art and urban design and architecture and having the artists work really collaboratively on the design of public spaces. It isn't that we had a piece of architecture built or someone did, and then we went out and bought art, you know, to decorate it. Not that at all. We, the designers of the buildings and the builders of the place, together worked out the sculpture and the art. So that the sculpture and the art are very integral to the form of the buildings and the materials and to the concept of the whole thing. When it came time to think about the idea of let's have some sculpture, Gonzalo von Seca was an obvious choice. He had worked for me before. He also knew Rosant. And so we were all kind of part of a family and friends, you know. My father did this portrait of me during the time he was doing rest in. And so while he was doing these monumental projects, he found time to do this portrait. Father was born in Montevideo, Uruguay. He did attend two years of architectural school. Then he met Joaquin Torres Garcia, who was a great modernist, painter, thinker. He began experimenting with all kinds of sculpture, influenced by architecture, history of architecture, antiquity of all kinds, plus his modernist constructivist training. I think Reston may or may not be the first instance, but it certainly is the most important instance of his kind of breaking into his own idiom. His work certainly was the result of so much digestion of great art together through the prism of his own understanding of modernism and his own incredible imagination. My father used to say that his, his work involves serious play. They're spontaneous and they're things to discover. 
hidden things. Just the sort of thing that children love. Father was almost oblivious to the art world and yet supported himself and his goal was to make the minimal, to keep going. Just before he died, he said, a lot of people want fame and fortune, I want time. It's the kind of man he was, the kind of artist he was. Gonzalo Fonseca and my dad would go out to the beach, both in Italy and in Long Island, and they would do sand sculptures. And we had, um, you know, little, uh, uh, trowels and things. And these aren't like sand sculptures that kids make. These were pyramids. These were incredible creations. And they'd compete on the sand and do beautiful little steps that would circle a building. And um, when uh, we, as kids, would go to Lake Ann after um, it opened, after it started, and see the sculptures, it was like walking into life-size sand sculptures. They were out of our imaginations of what my, my father and Gonzalo had built on the sand. The fountain in the center of the plaza is designed as a play fountain in a way so that kids of all ages, really, would not think of these things as sculpture primarily, but appeal to them more as something they played with and that made fun with water. It's a fun sculpture, and it makes the plaza full of laughter. Public art was essential in creating a public space. The shape of the plaza brings people to walk around it. The fountain invites kids to play. It's magical how it coalesces the whole plaza. Between Rosat and Fonseca, we really got public art where we wanted it. Community is what it's all about. Community is the interaction of people. That's my definition of community. I don't know if anybody else likes that definition, but I think it is. Community is interaction. And plazas are designed to foster interaction. create Reston Town Center, we knew we wanted something different. It's not very often you have the ability to put in the center of a city, in essence. We had to do something that was very special and that attracted people's attention right away. We knew within the first few months of our planning back in 81 uh, that a fountain was essential. In 1989, I was proposed for a competition to make a fountain. They have a few artists who proposed, and I made my proposal, which was very extravagant and very expensive also. But they, uh, they went for it, and it was uh, one of the greatest adventures. I made this precise model for the fountain, and I brought it to Italy. It took several months for them to carve that piece. The bowl was done in one piece, and then the spiral was done in two pieces. And then it was all put together on site. When I'm asked to intervene in a space and create something new for the space, what I want to bring to that space is what I would like to find myself in a space. It is a surprise. I would like people to come around the corner and say, what is this? Wow. It was a community involved with uh, in commerce, communication. So th there's a God for that, that's Mercury. So I decided to make the Mercury fountain. But this Mercury I made is not stable at all. 
I hired this model. He was like this, and I had to put pieces of wood attached to his arms and to his body so for him to be in the exact position I wanted, you know. The economic situation was not good. He was trying to find his balance, you know. Mercury was unsure. There's a great feeling about fountains. A fountain is a source of life, is water. I like the idea of public art that's human, closer to what human beings really like. I think that was, that was the key thing, doing that fountain. It gives you a sense of place and uh, makes you feel good. Public art is a major uh, aspect of placemaking. It lends distinction, identity, that sort of, I don't know why it's great, but it feels kind of different and cool to be here. Um, so I think public art can, can offer all of that to a place. Any evening, probably 10 months out of the year, where you sit at Mercury Fountain, the fountain's there, you see people gathered around it, talking, kids playing, and they may be engaged with the piece of public art and they're aware of it, but everybody in that space is feeling it. And that to me is uh, one of the most wonderful things that comes with public art, the spirit of community that comes alive in a place like that. I began to think about public art in Reston and the founding principles, talk about art and beauty in our public environment. But to make sure that that continued, I began to pull the community together to do this. Preston is very unique to have one singular advocate and visionary leading their public art program. To continue on the tales of the successful work of Fonseca many years ago and to look differently at what would public art in Reston look like now in the 21st century. And I think they're off to a great start. I was attracted to mosaics because of the solidity of the material. There's something about the sense, even though it's elusive, of the permanency of mosaic. If I had my druthers, I'd spend my life <laughs> mosaicing empty walls on highways and freeways and underpasses. So all of you are going to make little stars that I'm going to place throughout the big mosaic. Valerie at the Burge and her, her husband, they engaged the school, they engaged kids. The kids actually participated in designing the art along with Valerie. What more can you say about Reston than engaging our kids? That's a key component of what IPAR is doing with public art, is creating ways for people to have a meaningful connection to the art making process and to learn. We wanted energetic colors and colors that kind of represented colors on a flower, so we cho chose green, yellow, and orange. We're going to do like a green rectangle okay. of the smaller, um, ones. smaller ones and fill the rest in with red. Okay. Well, the stars that the kids made were great, and it just shows you how unique and precious every child is because each star was unique and precious. When the kids saw their work up on the wall, I mean, it was just the sense of ownership was very powerful and the enthusiasm that they were part of this bigger project. It, it feels really good. I feel like I've been a real part of something. I have to agree with Noah. It feels like we really helped con contribute to this. When people approach the mosaic, I hope that they are energized and feel the sense of the power of life. My hope for public art moving forward in Reston is that developers, 
and members of the community continue to embrace beauty in public spaces and in our natural environments as we evolve over time to come. I am often asked, what's the point of public art? What, what's the point? Well, what's the point of anything that's fun? To the extent that we can increase the pleasurable experience of living for other people, we've done something that's really very nice, very, very good. <laughs>